Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Grant Abbott, and I have the privilege of co-convening the Minnesota Achievement Gap Committee with its founder, <coughs> former mayor and U.S. Representative Don Frazier, who eight years ago started this wonderful project that carries out regular <coughs> forums during the year on good work being done to overcome the achievement slash opportunity slash culture gap and to deal with critical issues having to do with education. Today we're very fortunate to have Frank Forsberg, who is the Vice President of Greater Twin Cities United Way for Systems Change and Innovation, who's also the Interim Director for uh, Generation Next to tell us, give us an update on Generation Next, uh, where it is, where it's going, what's happening. And then also Munir and your last name I'm forgetting. Carcharamos. Carcharamos is going to talk about what's going on in the Promise neighborhood right here uh, in St. Paul. So at this point, uh, I would like to introduce to you Frank Forsberg. Excellent, yes. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. Frank Forsberg, I work with the United Way in the Twin Cities and also I'm serving as the interim uh, director for Generation Next and I've been doing that for about two months now and will do so for probably another month or two until Generation Next is able to hire a new executive director. And uh, it's been a fun and engaging couple of months and I'm sure the next two months will be that way as well. Um, I also get a chance to work with uh, Munir who I'll introduce in a little bit and serve on the uh, leadership council here at Wilder for the Promise neighborhood and I also play a leadership role over in Minneapolis with the Northside Achievement Zone and uh, so I uh, just want you to understand that I you know got a foot in a couple of these different projects and you'll see it in a couple of slides later where I'm trying to make sure I I bridge those things so the objective today is to um, uh, lay out for you and to provide for you an update on Generation Next. And so before I get into this slide around the data and the case, I thought I should give you a little history. I look around the room and I realize some of you may not have actually had a chance to, to hear a brief summary of the history of Generation Next uh, from a national perspective. And Strive was created uh, roughly six, seven years ago in Cincinnati. Uh, and the premise goes about like this. Uh, there was a college president, uh, probably for the University of Cincinnati, uh, by the name of Nancy Zimfer. And I saw her last week. And in her role as college president in Cincinnati, she was noticing some very troubling trend lines and having a very troubling experience in that role. And the simple version is, is that as she looked at her community, Cincinnati, she was noticing that m many of the low-income kids, and in particular children of color, were not doing well academically. And as she thought about that in her role as college president, what she was noticing is she wasn't able to engage and uh, educate many of the uh, lower income kids. And when they would come to her university, disproportionately, they needed significant remedial assistance. And so if you've met uh, Nancy, and many of you probably haven't, you can just imagine a college president who actually has a bit of uh, gravitas to her uh, and endless energy. And she began to use those attributes as a leader to begin to call and invite other community leaders to come have breakfast with her on a monthly basis. This would be the mayor, the school superintendent, some of the foundation presidents. And over the course of a year of her being diligent and using her kind of positional uh, capital, if you will, uh, she began to engage these community leaders from across sectors in the community in a discussion about the fact that in their community the educational achievement gap was very real and very serious and that as a group of 10 or 12 community leaders she was convinced they had some capacity to make a difference. If they actually would sit down at that level and really seriously try to come up with strategies that would leverage each other's resources and uh, skills and 
uh, and programs that they might have responsibility for, if those could be more smartly leveraged, they thought over time they could actually make a meaningful difference in the educational achievements and outcomes of uh, students in their community. And so that's the simple premise that Strive is built on, and it's evolved into kind of two other phrases you'll hear and you'll see in my work here or in these slides. And that is it's a cradle to career continuum. So you'll see that there are strategies and goals across uh, a child's life uh, until they graduate from college. And there's another uh, vernacular you'll see in here which is called collective impact. And it's intended to be what are the attributes that are required to get a cross sector of community to work together in a new way that goes beyond our traditional experiences of collaborating? What are kind of the richer, more tangible elements you might see uh, that would be required for effectively working together? So that's an introduction. Those are some key elements that I think help you see and understand what it is we're talking about. So here, uh, just a couple of slides. These are all things I think everybody in this room would know, but we uh, think it's important to make sure we pause and understand what the case is. Uh, this is data, third grade reading data from 2012. We all know when 2013 actually gets out and published, it's going to show more dramatic challenges because of the uh, new test. Uh, but in this case, you can begin to see the gap between uh, white students and uh, students of color here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, we then took and just added a few other little bar graphs so you can see the uh, differentiation in this case uh, with the Latino population. And then switching uh, over to 11th grade math, uh, you can see, this actually should concern us in a different sort of way, uh, you can see that uh, the Caucasian population or white population passes that test at a, about a 53% rate, and uh, children of color collectively at about 22%. Um, on a different day, if I had a different slide, I'd put, a, I'd put another bar graph up here, just to remind us where the top uh, maybe 15 countries in the world are in terms of their math skills. And it's just good for us to remember that this is not particularly robust at 53%. This is uh, just uh, should be horrifying to us in terms of kind of what the outlook is. And that countries ahead of us are probably above this 70% line. And so we can think about this most days as closing the achievement gap. But we also have to take a step back and realize we're in a global community and Increasingly, our students are falling behind when you look at the, the high numbers here. In this case, uh, I think when we built this slide, so we have uh, children of color at 22%, and then we just took, in this case, uh, the African-American uh, uh, success rate, which is about 12% passing this test. This is a nice picture of the Twin Cities. Generation Next is focused on serving the two core cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, at least for now as we get started. Uh, much talk about how and when we might expand regionally to perhaps first ring suburbs. I just want you to know today, until we get our arms around the two twin cities and the work that we're doing, uh, we're gonna stay focused on Minneapolis and St. Paul. So this is the case, our version of a Cincinnati community table. This is the Twin Cities version that we've built out. In the Twin Cities, the University of Minnesota did a little survey for us about two to three years ago. And in a simple survey, they were able to identify more than 500 individual efforts in the Twin Cities aimed at closing uh, the education achievement gap. Nonprofit programs, city programs, county programs, but disproportionately nonprofit driven. All right, so that's the starting point for that case. The initiatives focus on many kinds of things that you could think of. And when you study them, what you find is that there are very few ways to identify and learn from success and failure across organizational boundaries or community boundaries. <coughs> so said differently, even at a place like United Way, where we might fu fund 50 different youth and education-related programs, even us as a, a reasonably strong and 
uh, you know, competent funder are not setting up enough ways to share learnings between those 40 programs. So just isolating to that group, let alone does our community have any way from which, us, which we can share learnings uh, at a broader scale than just one funder. And so you realize that as a community, we continue to invest in somebody's next good idea. We rarely take enough time to prove whether or not any one of the 500 are really effective. And if we did have that capacity, we're not very good at actually doing something productive with a positive learning. That's an oversimplification, but sadly, I think this is the environment uh, that we're in. And so then if you look at it, and just expounding on this point, even those efforts that have the same priorities um, are actually measured differently. So if United Way funds something and the St. Paul Foundation funds something similar in a different part of the city, uh, between us we haven't organized ourselves in a way to collect the same data and begin to try to make some assessment about uh, those two things. And it just kind of keeps this spin going uh, in terms of our investments in the community. So I mentioned to you one of the uh, terms that's used often with STRIVE-related programs like Generation X is collective impact. Uh, what is that? Let's talk about that for a minute. We like to showcase this nationally and locally uh, with a nice vision of what we think is going on, in this case, with our 500 independent initiatives. Uh, and we think of this as uh, oftentimes isolated impact. Reminds me at United Way, our former CEO uh, used to look at me and say something equivalent to, uh, Frank, what good is it if the 50 kids in this uh, youth program are doing amazing if the rest of the community is going to hell in a handbasket? And it, it's one of those aha moments when you realize you have to begin to think and work differently at some of these big issues and just continuing down the road of 500 programs each serving 50 kids nicely just isn't effective enough as we go forward. So collaborative action, which we've all had some experience of in maybe some small ways, uh, begin to get these arrows to at least move in a similar direction. Uh, and we're able to make some level of alignment. And for communities out there who may be uh, you know, four or five years ahead of us, uh, they're trying to create an image that, that creates even more alignment amongst these efforts. Um, and some of the elements that you'll see in the upcoming slide, you know, that we have an increasingly more common agenda uh, in our community as it relates to education issues, um, and that these efforts that we should be working on now and in the future are much more data driven. We're increasingly collecting the same data, sharing it, using it for more collective decision making. And uh, anybody who's worked in this field in any fashion just realizes how disparate the data is from various sources or how hard it is to get the data if you're actually a nonprofit partner and you want to partner with schools or whatever the situation might be. Getting consistent data, people using consistent data together really doesn't happen very often. Very difficult. These are some of the elements of collective impact. Um, interestingly enough, about three years ago, consultants from the FSG Consulting Group over in Washington, D.C. began to study what they thought was some emerging trends in the communities across the country. And Strive was identified as one of uh, a number of examples they were seeing three years ago that they actually began to study and they put a label on it, if you will, and they called it collective impact. And I think it was communities like ours beginning to think about how we could work together differently, in this case on education, but there's other great examples of how communities can address a community problem from a cross-sector point of view in a collective way. Um, and I think some of this was triggered by the economic downturn. And then people like me, if you've had a chance to hear me speak before, I try to remind all my friends in the nonprofit sector um, that the way we solve problems in the past is in the rearview mirror and that the future is different. And one of the things I say about the future is that we got to get real about the fact that 
uh, most economists believe we're in long-term structural deficit because of the demographic changes and the impact on the economy. And what that translates to is we're not going to have abundant new money to fund brand new programs, brand new strategies at any significant scale. So the reverse of that is how do you begin to more seriously use community resources in a much more aligned way? I think that is really the future here, what we're trying to get at. Some of the key elements uh, for collective impact include making a serious effort to create a common agenda, um, getting very serious about shared measurement uh, and data systems so that objective decisions can be made from multiple points of view. Uh, mutually reinforcing activities. Um, this is a fancy way of saying uh, uh, a school might actually benefit a great deal from its partnering with local social service agencies and have done well. Things like food shelves and jobs and training programs and health programs actually uh, can make a big difference in supporting kids and families and help contribute toward educational outcomes. That would be reinforcing kinds of activities. Um, continuous communication. Um, this is really just a simple way of saying if you've ever been in a collaboration uh, and you get past about three human beings, um, the uh, need for communication actually increases uh, notably. And I've got some personal examples uh, uh, in my work with uh, uh, early learning and mini minds and a host of things. Um, I can spend hours every day just working on keeping a coalition informed about what's going on and moving in the same direction. And then um, they also wanted to make a big point here. If you're actually going to do this, you're going to have to have some kind of organizational infrastructure. Uh, they refer to it as a backbone organization, but how do you? create enough investment and stability that you can actually make these things happen. So in this case, uh, United Way uh, is a, has offered and is serving as kind of an initial host uh, to provide the financial support and HR support and other things, just to provide an initial three years of stability to help launch this effort. Here in the Twin Cities, a group of community leaders has come together uh, they spent a good part of last year uh, really building a strong coalition amongst themselves. And so in the Strive example of seven years ago where the college president stepped forward and began to convene every month, uh, here we had a senior vice president at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Robert Jones, who has since left uh, the Twin Cities and taken on a presidentship in uh, New York. Um, but he spent two years of his professional life helping put this table together. Um, and it is co-led by Eric Kaler, the president of the University of Minnesota, and Kim Nelson, a uh, executive vice president at General Mills. And so the two of them co-lead this table. Um, if you look at it and just think that, even though I didn't put the names there, the, this principally represents presidents in most cases of these entities or the senior staff, a couple occasions the vice presidents. Um, there's not another table I sit at that has this collection of people. I, I just don't go anywhere where both mayors, both superintendents, both the presidents of the teachers unions, uh, some of our great nonprofit leaders like Mike Hong Hong uh, from Wilder, or uh, business leaders, higher education, philanthropy. This is a pretty robust table uh, of leaders. In my role as interim, this is both a blessing and occasionally it has just a little bit of curse to it. Um, this is a table that can get a lot done. It's also a table where every single uh, one of those individuals used to be in, in charge and they all got a point of view. It's not always the same point of view. Uh, but they're accustomed to getting things done and then getting it done really quick. Um, mostly I look at this, I've, I've, I've spent the last 25 years working in the nonprofit sector here in the Twin Cities. I look at this and I say there's nothing but positive opportunity if we can figure out how to get this table to work effectively together. Nothing but upside. Because I've been involved in an amazing number of great projects at Catholic Charities and now at United Way that just get stalled because this table doesn't exist. You know, where I start taking a run at a great partnership in a local neighborhood, I spent 10 years working in Frogtown some years ago, 
we had some great programs working at some of the local public schools that instantly evaporated as soon as they changed out the principal. Well, that's not an effective way for us to use community resources. These kind of things with a table like this have to get actually addressed and, and uh, handled, I think, in a, in a much smarter and a much more effective manner. Moving on, um, I mentioned the anchor organizations. United Way is serving as that fiscal sponsor and initial host. But also here at Wilder, the research center with Paul Matesic and his team are playing a great role in providing data and also over time making sure we're leveraging the data services in our community between the two promised neighborhoods, uh, Sprockets here in St. Paul, and a host of other things. We're Wilder. Our community is blessed to have them. We're Wilder is actually the main data leader. So another place where we can really smartly leverage work that we're already doing. The uh, Leadership Council put together this vision and mission statement. It's just good to know that you know, they spent a year wrestling with this, not easy work. Uh, the vision, children of all socioeconomic backgrounds are well prepared for success in the 21st century. You remember my math line, at 50% we're really not that good. Uh, mission, dramatically accelerate educational achievement for all children from early childhood through uh, early career through an aligned partnership with community stakeholders. You can kind of hear that original strive table community building message. And then they went ahead and they named the five kind of key goals across that cradle to career continuum that Generation Next is committed to focusing on. Ready for kindergarten, every child meets third grade reading success. Uh, eighth grade math is really probably the most agreed upon <laughs> benchmark for math success. Uh, every child graduates from high school, and then finally, every child completes post-secondary education. That's the inspiring, aspiring uh, set of goals for Generation Next. We've uh, done the research and created a baseline, or you know, gathered the baseline data that we're able to share. Uh, and you can see uh, here that, for example, in uh, Minneapolis uh, public schools, 72 percent of the uh, kids enter kindergarten fully ready by the assessment tests that they use. Uh, in third grade reading at 64 percent and then they go on to eighth grade math where you start seeing those serious dips to 39 percent, etc. Um, we've identified that uh, and have begun to organize on the ground networks of professionals and other community leaders in the area of early grade literacy and also college and career readiness and um, uh, also are working on really significant ways to engage uh, 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 broad numbers of people in the community to make sure we get, I, I think, really thoughtful input about the strategies that we're working on. Some guiding principles, I, I won't read them all, but when the board spent a, you know, quite a number of meetings working on mission and vision, um, not everything got captured in those succinct statements uh, that got discussed. And with a group of 20 or 22 really robust leaders, uh, you had to find some other ways to begin to capture those conversations. So these were some of the things that came out and they wanted to make sure they captured. Uh, that we as Generation Next seek to eliminate racial and economic disparities in student outcomes while accelerating achievement for all. We will bring a sense of urgency to our work. We will make decisions based on high quality data and analysis. We will hold each other accountable for the success of our efforts and relentlessly measure outcomes. Uh, willing to engage in difficult conversations of complex issues. This got us into some serious discussion about uh, you know, uh, race and culture and uh, uh, various disparities uh, there that don't often get talked about in the Twin Cities very easily. And uh, we'll engage both the grass tops and the grass roots as we produce uh, really good ideas to move forward. Key projects for this year, uh, data, we published a 2012 baseline and we're in the process of updating that with 2013 data. And so as we mature, you'll see us go from a flat baseline of just data we collected in 2012 to a very simple dashboard to see what the change is from 2012 to 2013. And then in the future, 
I think you'll see us produce more robust uh, expressions of what the change is, positive or negative, on our uh, key goals. But we have to start with where we're at, which is some baseline, and then at least a, a simple comparison from 2012 to 2013. The networks, uh, we've got about 40 or 50 people from our community who have volunteered to work monthly on both the early grade literacy and college and career readiness. And so that's up and running and uh, we're building, I think, some good consensus of ideas and understanding there. Um, we've had a great task force uh, in the Twin Cities made up of about eight or nine researchers from Wilder, from the two schools, uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul District, uh, from the University of Minnesota. These guys have been working hard on non-cognitive goals. And uh, many of you probably follow this and Paul Tuff's work. Um, increasingly, there's co consensus that the non-cognitive goals or the social and emotional uh, development of young kids matters a great deal. And so how do you begin to build that into Generation Next as a way that strengthens our commitment to the five academic goals. So you're going to see more on that as uh, Generation X unfolds. And we were also the uh, lucky recipient of one of the Social Innovation Fund grants from the federal government. And we were awarded a million dollars a year over five years to actually go and make grants in our community to build evidence uh, of some of our most promising practices. So this year we actually uh, made the first round of grants. And uh, the objective of the Social Innovation Fund is to build evidence of what works. So you can kind of see and feel how that fits with Generation Next. And we've got uh, six grantees that between them uh, received $800,000 uh, for the first year. And in early grade literacy, um, we're working with these four entities. Uh, Serve Minnesota, the Minnesota Reading Corps, uh, the St. Paul Public Schools Foundation with their tutoring partnership. Way to Grow, which is a Minneapolis-based uh, group led by Carolyn Smallwood. They're uh, eight by great, or great by eight. And then here at the Wilder Foundation, St. Paul Promise Neighborhood has an early grade literacy effort. And on the uh, college and career readiness side, uh, we've got Achieve Minneapolis for their Step Up program, which is all about uh, helping young high school kids uh, have a meaningful summer work experience at one of, usually at one of our major corporations, and then uh, College Possible, uh, which you probably are all familiar with, which helps young, young high school kids uh, get mentored uh, uh, toward the transition to college. So these are, you know, quick overview of things we're working on this year with Generation Next as we get ready for the future. Uh, a couple visuals, uh, sometimes people want to see these things visually, so we're working on this as a way to express to our community that we see Generation Next as, as our ability to link these various sectors together. Uh, the nonprofit sector, which is kind of obvious, um, with our private sector, business leaders are engaged, they want to uh, deliver more than just grant money. Up in the upper right, the public sector, as you get working on this, uh, the cities and the counties have significant resources that can be aligned more effectively. And then our Twin Cities schools, uh, the public and charters uh, that we work with the most. And um, if you want to take all my words and translate them into an org chart, it would look something like this. Uh, some people, uh, this is how my mind works. Not everybody wants to see it in a box and grid, but uh, we have a leadership council who has created two networks, uh, early grade literacy and college and career readiness. We're very committed to data, so we really wrap both those committees in strong data support here from Wilder. And then um, one of the things I've added in the last two months is right in the center, it's a commitment uh, that Generation Next is going to work smartly with both the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood and the Promise Neighborhood in North Minneapolis, known as NAS. And the architecture of these efforts is all the same. It's all a cradle-to-career focus on educational uh, outcomes. Uh, it's the same goals. A number of us in the funding community make sure all three efforts have the exact same goals. And what you'll find when you hear from Munir is that uh, in a certain sort of way, the things that uh, the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, for example, are working on are really localized uh, to the uh, about a hundred or a couple hundred blocks here in St. Paul. But I wanted to give you this visual. And uh, my transition then to Munir is to kind of take that triangle out and make sure we look at it 
and just say, at least for me, I think this is a little piece of, it's not all worked out yet, but I'm working on it. It's a little piece of DNA about how I think a lot of this can work and what would make sense. And on the very top, I want to make sure we lead with a commitment to, edu to engage parents and to really unpack some of the cultural barriers, uh, racial barriers that they're experiencing in this equation. On the bottom right, how do we align our community partners in the nonprofit and public sector to be smartly organized? And in the bottom left, what matters a huge amount here is our ability to link in a really smart way with the schools. Individual schools or the districts, but really if you narrow this down to the base school, principal leaders and teachers are going to have to make some adjustments in how they interface with parents to make this triangle work. And they're going to have to make some adjustments with how they interface with the community to leverage the resources in really effective ways. So that's my long lead up into introducing my colleague Munir Karcher Ramos, who is the relatively new executive director with the St. Paul Promise Neighborhoods. Do you have more of an introduction? No, I just want to say thank you. For oh, yeah, good. If you have questions, please use the 3x5 card and pull them up and I will collect them. And then we'll ask the questions after Munir is done. You want this? Thank you, Frank, for uh, talking a little bit about Generation Next. We're kind of nestled within, the St. Paul Promise neighborhood is nestled within Generation Next and a real uh, partner in the work. And we're really the, the testers and the innovators down on the ground that inform uh, what's working and what's not. Um, for those who don't know where the St. Paul Promise neighborhood is actually located and what the boundaries are, we say we're, uh, we're a place-based initiative. Um, so we're uh, the, the tracks north of, the railroad tracks north of Pierce Butler. Uh, and um, to the west, we have uh, Lexington Parkway. To the east is Rice Street, and to the south is uh, more or less Selby. You'll see on the bottom right hand there is that it's a little bit jagged. We've actually built uh, the geographic boundaries around uh, census tracks. We also like to say that we're a people-based initiative because if you look at sort of what came out of Harlem, they did a lot of communi uh, comprehensive community development. And um, where I'm from in East Los Angeles, you can uh, make really good places but the people aren't necessarily doing well. So we always like to focus on we're both a place-based initiative and a people-based initiative, and never to forget that the, the people who live in that place and that we're also there to make um, sure that they're doing well. Um, so this is actually from our Sankofa Parent Power graduation, as well as the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood uh, Early Learning Summer Program that we just finished um, in August. Uh, Frank mentioned that uh, the Generation Next focuses from cradle to career. We're actually uh, focused uh, pre-birth through fifth grade. Uh, as you may have heard, as the St. Paul Promise neighborhood did not receive the federal implementation funding. Um, we missed uh, that, our proposal missed the mark by 0.34 of a single point. Uh, away from nailing uh, that proposal. But what that did is it actually reinvigorated and energized the group to think about, we have a really good proposal. We just have to figure out what can we do with the assets that already exist within our community to really push the work forward. So part of that was saying, well, we can no longer work on from pre-birth through uh, 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 career. So uh, really the pipeline focuses around early childhood and elementary school and um, 
We've aligned three goals um, up with that, with that pipeline focus. The first is children are ready for kindergarten, and the second is children are reading at proficiency by the end of third grade, which are both predictors of high school graduation, as well as goals for um, Generation Next. So we've aligned there with Generation Next. Uh, the third is children are ready to transition from elementary to middle school. And uh, the, the rationale behind that is when the St. Paul Public Schools is that our children got a, are expected to transition a year younger. So now between fifth and sixth, opposed to sixth to seventh. Um, so we wanted to really focus on how do we prepare our children for that transition. And our focus is really around those non-cognitive or social emotional um, development that Frank um, talked about. Uh, throughout all of that, we're really focused on parent engagement. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, later on. Uh, the St. Paul Promise neighborhood model is this, is that uh, at the core, our core function, and a lot of this happens within Wilder, and some of it help, happens elsewhere, is that uh, our navigation with family, which is really our uh, family engagement approach, uh, we're really a coordinator, a partner, or uh, in the collective impact model, that's the backbone organization. Um, research and database, we lift up the attention to culture, and we're going to name that in a little bit. Uh, communications and fund development. So when uh, the St. Paul Promise neighborhood is doing things, we're not necessarily a deliverer of services or programs, but we're on a liner, we're a convener, we're uh, really pulling together the partnerships to make sure that our kids are at the right place and that the barriers for our children to access those um, spaces and places or organizations or services or opportunities are actually there. So we use our database to also identify who's most likely to benefit opposed to um, you know, just filling up a warm body in the room. Um, the second, I guess, uh, circle there is uh, the pipeline and metrics, and I, I mentioned each of those already. Uh, the green is the programming interventions. Um, our we've changed that to programming partnerships. And on the left there, we have our Race to the Top scholarships, which came from the federal government. Uh, so that is accessing high quality early learning centers through parent, uh, are rated through Parent Aware, which are three or four star, se um, uh, three or four star uh, early learning settings. Um, we have partnership with uh, Parent Aware, and we're thinking about their accessibility um, and making sure that more people, are, our organizations, are getting Parent Aware. Partnership with Head Start. I'll talk a little bit more about Incredible Years, but that's a, a program, um, a parenting program around early childhood education, and then partnerships with our pre-K program. We have three, at the top, we have three partner schools. Uh, that's Jackson, Maxfield, and St. Paul City School. So Jackson and Maxfield um, are within the St. Paul Public School District, and then St. Paul City School is um, a charter school in the neighborhood. Uh, to the right, bottom we have uh, our family resource centers which are nestled within the school and we'll talk about how that fits into our um, family engagement strategy. On the outside ring is our community and social support. So we've launched three networks, the early learning network, the health, it says COP, but it means uh, community of practice, as well as the housing community of practice which is hosted by the Frogtown Rondo Home Fund. And each of these groups plays three purposes. The first is sharing best practices and lessons learned. The second is actually driving resources to or responding to the demands of those family resource centers at the bottom of that green uh, circle there. And then the third is a community systems change project. So what that looks like in the health committee is they're working on uh, the healthy food systems network to really push that, um, to look at the disproportionality of access to high quality foods and um, healthy eating. So that would be their community systems change project. We have not launched our mental health community of practice, which we're really thinking about uh, school-based mental health, as well as our social emotional development network, which we're hoping to house through the Sprockets network. So um, 
Earlier, Frank mentioned one of the projects that Generation Next is really pursuing is the Social Innovation Fund. And the St. Paul Promise neighborhood was one of those recipients of, that, uh, of the Social Innovation Fund. Um, and we argue, this is actually our academic theory of change, but uh, Generation Next really got us to think about, well, what is it? Um, we say that students, parents, and everybody else has a cultural lens through, it, through which they see the world. And through that lens, as we begin to act in a very particular way, we begin to think in a very particular way. And as a result, what is happening in our education system may be also a result of that. So we argue that the opportunity gap is, um, is a byproduct of the lack of cultural engagement that we see in the schools. And we see that on two levels, both the social emotional development as well as school-based skills. And if we, basically any of the pieces of the puzzle are in this green that we have there, is we're always placing that piece of the puzzle into the conversation. Um, so with um, you know, Beacons and, and Sankofa Parent Power, Freedom Schools, we're adding this cultural component to it. And what we mean is that if we are culturally engaged, that all students and families have access to educational opportunities that honor and fully integrate their cultural practices, values, communication preferences, and learning styles. And as a result of that, in the short term, we argue is that all students and families are intrinsically motivated for literacy and school success, which will then begin to address the achievement gaps around our kindergarten goal and third grade, um, third grade goal. So um, part of what Frank mentioned earlier with the Social Innovation Fund is that we're building the evidence for this, um, for this, this theory of change. And uh, we're working with the University of Minnesota on validating whether this, to the degree to which it actually matters. Uh, when, we, when we fill in that cultural engagement um, or opportunity gap. So with Incredible Years, which is covered under the Social Innovation Fund, is that um, we're culturally adapting the curriculum, which is very much standardized for a uh, European-American um, population. And instead, we began to say, um, we saw that it wasn't working. This is actually hosted at the Wilder Child Development Center. And uh, we're working with Rich Lee at the University of Minnesota to culturally adapt it around African American and Hmong um, parenting and the, the parenting choices there. So I always say that parenting is one of the most obvious, non-obvious cultural practices that we have. And we very much learn that you know, through the gaps of participation and uh, different concepts that were forward forwarded through um, incredible years, which is a nationally and internationally based, strong evidence-based practice that we've been operating at, at Wilder for about the past 10 years or so. And what does that actually look like in practice? So with the Hmong population, um, there's something with parenting and authority. So the, the curriculum, uh, incredible years curriculum, would have you set in a circle um, with no chairs or table, or no, no tables in between you. But within Hmong culture, it is a most appropriate, if you're in an authority, a place of authority, to put the table in front of you and teach differently there. We moved different concepts from um, you know, these different funnels that were incredible years into a house. And it, it's really about the place making that needed to happen. And there's other language types of things we adapted to, um, as well as very particular things within Hmong parenting um, that the uh, curriculum um, was adapted to. Um, what we see now is lower dropout rates in the program in terms of greater retention is probably the better way to say it within incredible years. And then the increase um, in at-home practices. So every single week our parents leave um, and are expected to go and model and practice the different parenting techniques at home. And they come back and report that they're actually more likely to do it because it's something that they can um, understand and um, latch on to. With San Sankofa Parent Power, um, our participant population is children of African descent. So this could be uh, children from um, the continent of Africa or uh, African American children uh, who often have poor reading scores and lack the motivation to read. So this is when the Network for Development of Children of African Descent, or NITCAD, which is Giovanni Ford's organization, you know, these are sort of the, the ideal participant characteristics of who they want to work with. And their method um, is deconstructing myths using counter narratives, using cultural counter narratives. So what they'll say is that society says as black children or as black people, um, this is 
what is out there. These are the stereotypes out there. There are these myths about us that exist that get into and in, ingrained into how we think about ourselves. But no, we shouldn't be thinking about that. Instead, we're going to use a counter narrative of uh, powerful or successful um, people who, um, within the African American culture, who who we see as um, you know success, and that we can latch onto that, and as, as a result, we'll become intrinsically culturally motivated for literacy and school success. Our preliminary results there is we're seeing <coughs> students improve two to five reading levels, not to be confused with grade levels, um, in in nine weeks. Um, so we're seeing quite quite a bit in its uh, of uh, improvement there along um, our reading skills there. One thing I didn't mention um, in the previous um, model is that um, you'll see, you know, Sankofa slash Parent Power. Well, our every programming um, partnership that we have is actually from a two-generational approach. Um, we never just have, quote unquote, a, a child intervention or a parent intervention. But we always bring the two together so that we're actually working at both levels, the parent and the child, with everything that we're doing. Um, so for me personally, my, my father, we grew up in East Los Angeles, which is a very Mexican um, dominated area. And my dad was not allowed to speak Spanish, right? He was told at school he could not speak Spanish. His educational experience was muddied and um, you know, moved in a backwards direction for him because what he was taught at home was not allowed at school. For me, my educational experience is informed by what my dad thought about, um, about school. So my own perception of school was also very much of what my dad went through and how he thought about school. And myself, I had numerous potholes thrown you know, along my way um, as well, around not being, despite graduating with a 4.096 high school GPA, never being invited to any of the honors coursework never being um, you know, pulled into the, um, you know, the boy state sort of extracurricular types of thing is that all these potholes were thrown that reinforced everything that my father said despite my good grades. So when we talk about our families, they have a very comparable um, experience. Their parents have you know, very comparable to what my dad had and then how we talk about school is also shifting how we begin to um, how our children begin to think about it. So that's what we always say. If we're in a high quality early learning setting, we have incredible years saying, how do we reinforce that uh, positive learning environment at home and get our parents to think about that? Sankofa parent power is the same thing. We have high, how do we get our kids in high quality, you know, out of school time, um, early literacy programs and match that reinforcement and the deep discussions about um, you know, racism and other things that our, our, our parents are experiencing and making that at the parent level and say, how do you support your child in the educational process? Um, we also had uh, Freedom School and uh, Parent Academy coupled together so that Freedom School is our summer learning loss prevention program and this is predominantly focused on African American children but we have uh, many other um, students from other cultural backgrounds so the top the top uh, picture there is our, our early learners, our, our babies went to uh, Governor Dayton's office to hear the Okie Dokie Band, which was a Grammy award winning um, artist. And then um, just other snapshots from, from Freedom School. And that approach is integrated reading cu coupled with cultural enrichment. And we'll have some um, preliminary results in, in October 2013 about, you know, did we prevent uh, summer reading loss and to what degree? Um, I'll quickly go over our family engagement um, in the St. Paul Promise neighborhood as well as um, we have it at three levels um, our family engagements. We have family and community centers in the schools. We have the Center for Cultural Family and Learning, Jackson Family Center, and then we're building ours out at uh, St. Paul City School. Um, in, in school parent support as well as education and community navigators. And you can kind of see the different goals we're aiming through. Uh, aiming, aiming to achieve through our family engagement model. Um, our family and community centers in the schools are uh, physical space in the school building for families and community members to convene. Um, it's home of the navigators and other engagement staff. And the physical space is really a, a space of cultural at reaffirmation, uh, parent and community recognition, and where our elders and parents from the community gather. 
Um, in school parent support, there's a couple different things. We do make sure we're greeting, make sure we're giving school tours, um, and really trying to increase that sense of school belonging um, in the school. Um, our education and community navigators, through this process, we're really trying to address the unspoken needs, conditions, and dynamics, which inhibits students and their families from becoming actively engaged in the education process. So our partners are the Cultural Wellness Center, Hmong American Partnership, St. Paul College, which was just named the number one community college in the nation, Open Cities Health Center, and the St. Paul Public Schools. And we often ask ourselves is, you know, people come to us with housing concerns, but often they're actually coming to us for something else. We try to get beneath the surface of um, what else is out there. Um, you know, be beyond what is the housing need, and we often learn it may actually be um, embarrassment about um, their own literacy rate as parents. It may be that they're homeless. It may be um, that they actually need a job. So we try to take what are people coming to us and hear? What are the things beneath it all? What are what aren't we hearing? I think um, is something that we keep focusing on. So we look at it. Uh, we look at ourselves and our navigation process as the facilitator of the process for family self-efficacy and placing demands. Um, so we ask our families, where do you want to be? And you can see um, some of those answers that they, that they give us. They want to be the first and best advocate for their child and their, and their child's education. They want to know how to navigate complex societal systems. They want little or no dependence on the government. They want independence and self-sufficiency yet rooted in their cultural communities. Um, and, and other communities. They want an emboldened sense of self and identity. They want restored family and community. Engaged in a kinship network where it's possible to participate in the community. So uh, we really focus on our, our families aren't empty vessels to be filled, but rather we provide the space to see what they already have and the assets that are already there, opposed to saying, here's a service. Here's an opportunity, or this is what you have to do. So they develop self-care plans in order to really move themselves forward as we grapple with the different issues at hand. Um, some of our uh, early results is we have increased academic goal setting by 233%, increased parent-teacher conference participation by 125%, average 125 parents for um, monthly parent nights, and parents knowing how to navigate the school system. So we move. Those were last year's figure with four navigators. Now we've moved to 17 navigators this year through multiple funding streams. And we believe there's a whole lot of power behind, behind that. We just did a two-day training last week. So I guess I'll end on adapting our mindset. Um, what we really argue for is that two-generational approach. It shouldn't happen at the child level or just at the parent level, but both. We believe culture matters, and we're uh, we're going to fight to prove it <laughs> uh, through, through the Social Innovation Fund, through Generation Next. We should look at self-efficacy um, as a critical factor in sustainability. If our families are ultimately effective, that's sustain the best sustainability that we can have. And then our, our mantra that we keep talking about with our staff and our navigators is, don't admire the symptoms, ask what's at the root. So we often talk about the achievement gap, but that's something that is produced, and it's a byproduct, and it's a symptom of something else. So always ask ourselves, what's at the root? And that's it. Thank you. I've given Frank the questions that we've received, and you want to start? Yeah, I'm going to read them to the engineer so he can answer. <laughs> 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 to generation next, but some of them are broader. So if yes. you can get behind, we need to make sure we. You want get, these mic too? We no, want to just make sure you're that both. right there. Just we can yeah. hear. You okay, we just do these joints. Yeah, the microphone, by the way, is not for us. It's for the video. <laughs> so, yeah, All right, so I've I've got a couple, and I'll read them. And can we also just take some live? No. No, we're just doing this. All right. Uh, well, let's go with the first one then. Uh, the first one is, um, have we determined the total spend on our children in Minneapolis-St. Paul, including government, nonprofits, businesses, and foundations, et cetera? And right this minute, I would say no, but we're hot on it. And um, so what I mean by that is, 
Generation Next, uh, one of the things I failed to mention when I laid out the case of 500 initiatives, uh, there was another study we didn't label uh, directly, um, but a couple of our foundations put forward a study to see how much philanthropy was investing in education related initiatives. And in 2000, I believe 10 or 2011, it was approximately $100 million of philanthropic money from uh, foundations in Minnesota going into efforts to close the achievement gap. And so we start with that $100 million a year. And um, the second thing I've been thinking a lot about is in addition, between the two public schools of Minneapolis and St. Paul, you're probably looking at somewhere around 1.2 billion in funding between those two districts. Somebody smarter would know that answer, but I, it's going to be plus or minus that a little bit. And then I, I've only begun to engage the two counties, for example, who are investing significant human service or social service dollars into very high risk children and families. And so I want you to know those folks are at the table and engaged, so we might get a kind of a strong number on that in the next year. Do you have comments about total funds uh, from a neighborhood perspective? Well, we're just mapping it out locally, the landscape out locally around funding, what's it going into, what goals are it, uh, where are we basically, where are all the funds being invested? So this Promised Neighborhood thinks about our alignment and coordination. We also use that collective impact model. We didn't go into detail. Uh, but it's really around that partnership and coordination where we begin to say, well, where is the funding going and where isn't it? Um, and what's the impact that it's actually making? Great. Thanks. All right, another question. Uh, it's a I'll consider this a two-part question, and I'll frame it up this way. How does Generation Next recognize and incorporate cultural differences? I'm going to share that with Munir in a second. And um, when we think about those cultural differences, will that eventually affect how we set goals? Will we adjust our goals for some of the academic outcomes? So I'm going to start with the academic outcome question first, and I think Munir can speak to the cultural differences more succinctly. Um, so far, the conversation with Generation Next at the Leadership Council on academic goals um, has been rich and robust, but it has been very focused on uh, trying to focus our energies on closing the academic achievement gaps. And when I say that, I think the uh, diverse leaders, starting with Kim Nelson, who's co-chair, has been pressing hard for the fact that uh, she wants to set and hope that we continue to set very high academic bar for all kids at all of the academic points that we're talking about. And so I don't think she or other leaders uh, on the Leadership Council see differentiated goals uh, based on race or culture. And in fact, just want to accelerate the achievement toward math and reading and the other goals that are listed there. Um, Munir, I think uh, when I think about Generation X and culture, I want you to know part of the reason I want to really strongly align with both the Promise neighborhoods is that I think they're doing some of the leading work on developing really smart partnerships with parents and engagement and help. I think they can help teach us a lot about culture and race. So from the perspective of the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, we do use a racial equity lens. And when I hear what is sort of specialized or, um, you know, the, the standard measure, actually it's not even the right, right card there, but uh, the racial equity lens is basically is um, we really focus and narrow in on very specific communities and uh, develop strategies um, around those. So some of the things we, we heard today is I didn't talk about the data for why we built out incredible years um, for Hmong and African American um, cultural communities as well as why we work on Sankofa parent power um, in that lens. But it's very much rooted in the data and um, taking differentiated approaches um, along those lines to make sure that um, it's not a one size fits all type of solution and making sure that we're um, res being culturally responsive and actually meeting those types of needs and demands there. Our colleague over in Minneapolis, uh, Sandra Samuels, and their team with Northside Achievement Zone are also doing, I think, exemplary work in this area. So great learnings to be had. Do you have a question there? Yeah, this question is about data. 
Uh, since more than 500 public and private initiatives focus on closing gaps, however, there is a need to have a standard measurement. The data dashboard and networks, such as non-cognitive, and the five goals and social innovation funds were mentioned in the 2013 projects. When will the collective approach address collective measurements for initiatives? <laughs> Isn't that great? I, I thought for sure it was going to be a promised neighborhood question <laughs> that I could comment on. <laughs> um, we're making pretty good headway on this right now. I would expect in 2014 that we would release a multi-year strategy uh, to begin to align uh, the assessments and the data collection um, with some uh, data sharing agreements between schools and local communities. Um, as anybody who's worked on this knows, that's all tough sledding. So I'm pretty certain we won't solve all the challenges uh, next year, but we're going to at least get what we think are achievable or attainable uh, immediate steps laid out. And um, there's some strive efforts around the country who I think are really doing notable work on this. And once again, I think if we just look to the two promised neighborhoods, I can speak about Northside Achievement Zone. They've really made some great progress in 18 months working with 10 schools in North Minneapolis, both public and charter, uh, where increasingly the data is being shared, I think, more freely. And they've actually got a data system uh, where as families enter the NAS Northside Achievement Zone program, uh, they begin to populate a joint and shared database that many nonprofits and the schools use together. And so they're able to track, I think, more robustly uh, and real time uh, what programs and services are children and families able to access. They're also able to identify what might be missing. Uh, that a ch child could participate in or benefit from. So I think those kinds of uh, data sharing efforts uh, that are being designed and executed in our neighborhoods are ones that ultimately might be replicable in other situations. And you might have a few comments so far on your experience with St. Paul Promise Neighborhood. Sure. Yeah. So uh, on the data lens piece of it is that uh, we have a really great um, data sharing agreement with the St. Paul Public Schools as well as St. Paul City School. And I would also say it's that um, using data and having data be shared in other ways that it typically isn't. Um, so our navigators, for example, have access to data from all three schools and are better able to um, understand and adapt uh, how we work with children and families based on the results that we see. So all that's through our comprehensive St. Paul Promise Neighborhood Database, which is all of our partners and, and um, marks all of our engagement efforts, um, you know, and everything else there. I'm trying to think what else is. I think it's really just the uh, alignment and making sure that we do use the same measures as well as that uh, hope that our tests don't change every four or five years. Um, and I know in early learning around... Um, you know, kindergarten readiness, I think we're, everyone's using different tools, whether it's a Mondo, it's a IGDI, or it's a BKA, or it's, you know, the list goes on and on and on, is figuring out what does it mean to align uh, line around there. All right, the next question uh, is uh, focused on what have we learned here in the Twin Cities from Strive in Cincinnati? or other strive sites around the country. So I think it's a question about what can we look forward to and what might be a logical path. And so here's a, a quick answer uh, as I see it uh, uh, you know, in the work that I've been doing. Um, every strive site around the country has tried really hard to focus on what are the gaps and the resources in their community. And so they're all very localized approaches. One of the things that uh, Cincinnati is recommending and many uh, uh, Strive sites are adopting is look for areas where you can make immediate progress um, and areas or things that you can do that many entities can join in or share in uh, so that uh, lots of uh, entities can be involved. Or said differently, don't pick uh, efforts uh, that cost so much money uh, or are going to run into such political uh, pushback that you can't move in the first year. And so examples that you might see from Cincinnati or in other parts of the country uh, would include very targeted efforts to increase uh, the completion of FAFSA forms. Uh, 
college application for financial aid forms, where if you begin to look at that data and you can find out instantly uh, that disproportionately low-income children and children of color may not be completing that. Well, how does a school and a community rally around that? It uh, doesn't require you know, significant new programming dollars. How do you rally around that and put systems in place to really increase the number of uh, children and adults who actually know that that needs to be completed, give them the support to get it completed, and begin to change uh, the course on something like that? Uh, and a couple of our other schools um, uh, addressing the issue of transportation for preschool and kindergarten. Uh, was seen as a huge barrier and so you've seen uh, schools and communities rally around actually really significantly increasing participation in those kinds of early learning programs by uh, using their community resources differently to get more kids in the seats uh, with the resources that they have available. Um, I think some examples, I'll, I'll tee it up for uh, Munir here, but I think these, he's got some examples that are happening in St. Paul with after school programming, with beacons and summer programming that I think is happening in other uh, communities across the country. So kind of when I think about Strive is I always try to lift up this, this it is this collective impact piece of it and uh, with, within our health committee we have about 16 or 17 organizations who are really rallying behind our kids in this neighborhood and driving those resources uh, to our family resource center and working on those community systems change projects and sharing best lesson, our lessons learned and best practices and it's been a pretty powerful experience if I were to go and bring up you know choose five people from that from that health committee and they would tell you is that we didn't think we were part of the solution in thinking about a food system for example and that's what we're focusing on now so health partners said we're an unexpected um, you know partner in this work and we figured out a way that we don't have to change anything we're doing we just have to rethink how we do it and through that process um, these unexpected partners from a small cultural wellness center to, you know, a Health East and a Health Partners and Wilder and Open Cities Health Clinic have came around and said, how do we work differently together and still talk about power dynamics? How does that play out in terms of us, um, um, who does what and where and why? And we sort of debrief on anything that we do collectively from a small health fair into really pushing this collective agenda um, of what's, what's going on. The th other thing we identified through this you know, collective impact is that you may have uh, a core indicator, so I'll just use our health committee to stick with that, is that it was children eat five fruits and vegetables per day. So we said, well, we can do that by just putting five fruits and vegetables on their plate at school. And there we go, we solved, we solved the indicator. We, we met that indicator and you know, we're good to go. Instead, people around the table, the health committee said, well, it's not actually about that. It's really about geographic availability, accessibility, the system design and accommodation that the system has for our parents and families, acceptability, which is really about um, cultural preferences and eating behaviors of the consumer and individual as well as accountability. So that's really what we began to shift from just an indicator into collective impact around these sub-indicators which for us actually got beneath the problem. So again when I think about Strive it's collective impact and what are the lessons learned there and you know these are just some of the things that you know kind of boiled to the top for us um, and of course I had more to say but well all right, well, I'll pick up. So I, I, I set this question up with, here's what's happening across the country in the first year or two. It's kind of easier things that communities can address because you have to actually move forward and create some success. And uh, there are some things that can be done in almost any situation. When I look at Strive uh, examples that might be four or five years old, those that have a little more maturity to them, they're beginning to get into some more difficult uh, what I would call system reform issues. All different, not consistent across the country, but based on what the unique situation is within their particular school or community. And so you will find examples within Strive in which uh, the focus is on principal training and development to strengthen the leadership and the role of that principal or on teacher development and training so that teachers are more aware of how they interface with and teach and work with 
uh, uh, children from very diverse cultural backgrounds. And you begin to share the information about what is the rate of suspensions in various cultural groups. And how do teachers begin to adjust their classroom work and their own uh, engagement so that we begin to change what those suspension rates are so that young children are in the classroom more hours, more time. So you're beginning to see those kinds of efforts that are then associated uh, with uh, strive related programs. So building on the in, uh, kind of the easier to do alignments, which are not easy, but the building on those and then getting into some of the more complex uh, challenges that a school might face. Yes? All right. Uh, this question is about robust engagement of the voices of youth. And uh, as I've been looking at that with Generation Next, what we've done is as we've been building out the uh, network for college and career readiness, uh, we have engaged what we think are some of the uh, most on the ground uh, providers of direct service for high school youth. So achieve uh, Minneapolis, the Youth Coordinating Board, Youth Prize, Sprockets. Uh, these are ones that I can name right now. And we in, are already actively engaging youth uh, from those organizations in putting forward their voice, their ideas, uh, their strategies. And I think you'll just see more of that as we go forward. So trying to work with what's already in place and make that stronger as we engage young people. And do you have any comments on youth engagement? Just that we have youth councils at each of the schools that inform our work in different places um, and spaces for how we actually operate. So I'll just keep it brief. Great. Again, let's uh, give a thanks to Frank and to Munir.